Hi, Carlos. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. We are now at live in YouTube too. So oh, awesome. Yeah. I would like first to thank you for accepting our invitation. And I will sure. give some information before we start with your talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, everybody that is in YouTube live right now in the second advanced school of Autonomy Medicine. Uh, welcome. Welcome you all. Uh, we have 216 participants already registered for this uh, for this advanced school in medicine. We will have three invited speakers. The first one would be Dr. Uh, Carlos Finaldi from University of Florida. He would be teaching, uh, he would be giving the mini course on magnetic particle imaging, tracer and design in applications. The first and the second lecture today uh, in the next two hours. We also have at 2 p.m. Brazilian time, Dr. Robert Ivko from Johns Hopkins University with the mini course applications of magnetic iron oxide nanoparticles for cancer hyperthermia and immunotherapy. And in the end of the day, from 4 to 6 p.m., Dr. Rohan Fernandez from the George Washington University, United States too, with the mini course combining photothermal nanoparticles with immunotherapies for cancer therapy. Well, the questions should be put in the chat in, the, in, the, in YouTube, so please feel free to include there uh, any questions that you have. We will have a lecture to around 40 to 50 minutes, and after the, the first lecture, we will open for questions. So, But you can be putting the questions as you wish in the chat. I will be transferring here to Dr. Carlos Hinaldi. Uh, it would be nice also that you include your name uh, and the institution that you are in the country with the questions. And if you could do it right now so people could, could see from where you are participating would be really nice. We have people from Brazil, of course, from all the, the regions in Brazil. From North, we have uh, registrations from at least four universities, from Northeast seven, from Southeast 13, from South three, from the center of Brazil 15. We have three institutions, participants from three institutions from India, and United States of America, two from Argentina, one from China, Colombia, Portugal, and Germany. Uh, I welcome you all. And I will finally talk a little bit about Dr. Carlos Hinaldi, who I highly appreciate to accept our invitation here. Uh, Dr. Carlos Hinaldi is the chair and dean's leadership professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Florida. He's also a professor in the J. Creighton Pruitt Family Department of Biomedical Engineering. He received his bachelor degree in chemical engineering at the University of Puerto Rico and completed degrees in Master of Science in Chemical Engineering, Master of Science in Chemical Engineering Practice, and Doctor of Philosophy in Chemical Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Prior to the University of Florida, he worked in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Puerto Rico. He is one of the leading scientists in the areas of ferrohydrodynamics, biomedical applications of magnetic nanoparticles, and transport of nanoparticles in complex and biological fluids. His research spans from theory and simulations of magnetic nanoparticle response to dynamic magnetic fields, nanoparticle synthesis and surface modification, characterization of nanoparticles interaction with biological environments. He had worked a lot, you will see by, by in, in his talk, in his mini course, it's one of the fields that he works so in the field of nanomedicine. He has developed several interesting, uh, he had found several interesting things. One of the things that he, he was, the, his group was the first to demonstrate that receptor targeted nanoparticles can kill cancer cells without a percentile microscopic temperature rise through disruption of lysosomes and activation of lysosomal death pathways. There are several other things that we will be noticed here and more recently, he has contributed to understanding the physics of magnetic nanoparticle response to alternating magnetic fields, enabling rational design of high sensitivity and high resolution tracers for magnetic particle imaging, which is an emerging biomedical imaging technology that he will be discussing today. He's committed to mentoring new generations of scientists and engineers seeking solutions to biomedical problems and to broadening participation of women and minorities in science and engineering. It is a real great pleasure to have you here with us, Dr. Carlos Hinaldi. Thanks for accepting our invitation and being able to talk with us live here in the Second Advanced School of Nanomedicine. Thank you, Andres. I'm going to share my screen.
uh, a window. Oh, this is oh, it's different. Should be yeah, this is yeah, different. Yeah. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos, in the right, in the below, in the right, there should be a presentation now. Yeah, I'm just yeah, trying to choose what. Each one and I, we, we have different uh, softwares to do that, right? And you need to share with everybody. Yeah, now yeah. it says I need to grant permissions to share. So give me a second. Says you must grant permissions in order to screen share. Really? Uh, I'm not seeing here. I'm not receiving here anything. Yeah, I'm not receiving anything. I thought that you could be could be doing it by yourself already. I might have pressed the wrong button. I'm sorry. I'm not receiving anything here. Yeah, give me a second. I press present now. Your entire screen says can't share your screen. You must grant permissions in order to share. Excuse me, I'm not seeing here anything that I that I should be presenting here. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm worried that something on my end. I'm on a Mac, and I've never I've never used this platform, so. Well, how should we do then? Uh, Give me a second. I'm not sure if there is a if there is another option here. Well, I'm worried it's a it's a Mac accessibility thing. I sent you a message. I don't know if by that you will be allowed to. Oh, I think I got it. it. Let me see. Okay. I'm going to have to quit Firefox and come back. So I'll be back in a sec. Before. Yeah. yeah. So now you can see me, and I think now I'll be able to share my screen. I, I was having a little bit of trouble, but I think now you should be able to see my presentation. Perfect. Now, now it's entering. Now it's entering. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot. Um, sorry for the technical issues, uh, but I'm happy we can get started. Um, I want to thank um, Andres for the invitation. I'm delighted to participate in this. Um, I am sad that I was not able to visit Brazil because of the pandemic. This would have been my fourth trip to Brazil, um, and I've, I've enjoyed every trip, um, and I look forward to more. Um, and so maybe in a future year, I'll be able to come down and, and meet um, some of you at that time. Um, so my, my name is Carlos Finali Ramos, and uh, Andres already introduced me, so I won't do a lot of that. I'll talk a little bit more about my background in a second because I think it's important. And, and I think um, it, you know, in this day and age where we don't have the ability to meet each other in person at these conferences, I think it's a good idea to share a little bit about our, you know, who we are and, and how we got to where we are. Um, today I'll be I'll be starting a tutorial on magnetic particle imaging. There's several talks, and but since I'm gonna I'm gonna talk for about two hours now, this is this this session is gonna be about two hours with some breaks. 
I didn't break it into two talks. I, it's just going to be a series of vignettes and topics. So uh, before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about me and where I am. Um, and so I was born in Puerto Rico. That's uh, an island in the Caribbean. Um, it is a territory of the United States, um, which is an interesting situation. People in Puerto Rico are born US citizens, but we don't have the right to vote for president and we don't have a voting member representative in Congress, which is an interesting situation. And that's really a matter of living in the island. It's a beautiful island in the, in the Caribbean. It's a tropical island, so beautiful beaches. So I, I grew up going to the beach a lot. And I also went scuba diving. I know Brazil has some beautiful beaches as well and I enjoy visiting when, I, when I've been there. Um, I did my undergrad at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. I was really interested in biomedical engineering, but um, there was no program available um, when I was an undergrad. And so I studied chemical engineering instead, which is really a great discipline um, in terms of being able to later apply the concepts to biomedical problems. Um, as Andre said, I did my master's and PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in theoretical transport phenomena, specifically the high dynamics of magnetic nanoparticle suspensions, and this was in the late 1990s. And ferrofluids, uh, which is another name for those suspensions, have been, you know, have been very actively researched since the 1960s, including by a lot of people in Brazil. And so I, I started out my career reading a lot of that literature, um, but I was um, really interested in, in the biomedical applications of these materials, and, and I hope today I'll explain to you why these are exciting. Um, after obtaining my PhD, I went back to Puerto Rico. This was my first group. These are my two first PhD students, um, Adriana Herrera and Victoria Calero. They're both from Colombia. And um, this is my group almost um, right before I left um, Puerto Rico. And, um, and so by then it was 12 PhD students and three postdocs and a troop, and a troop of undergrads. And it was a very happy time, you know, it, it, for me, it was going back home um, to be a faculty in Puerto Rico, but it was also, unfortunately, it eventually it became limiting in terms of our ability to do biomedical research, interact with uh, scientists in the medical schools, and also do animal experimentation, which is critical for many of the projects we were interested in. So we were very lucky. So we, we left, you know, my family left Puerto Rico. And we were very lucky to find a nice position here at the University of Florida. And the University of Florida is a major institution. We're talking 55,000 uh, students on campus, thousands of faculty and staff. Um, almost every discipline imaginable, we have uh, a program in that discipline. Um, very strong medical school, very strong vet school, very strong ag and bio school, and very strong engineering and sciences. And so that, that's a really ideal environment, I think, for the research that we do. It's also um, warmer than most of the United States. So for us, growing up in the Caribbean, it was it's the best uh, possible climate, I would say, in the continental US. There's a nice um, Hispanic community. So this is a, a, at a party that's thrown by Puerto Ricans here every year. There's a lot of um, Brazilians. And, and I want to say I've had several students from Brazil visit my lab. Um, and spend um, uh, periods of time. In fact, here's Nathanie Rost, uh, who was a visiting student from Brazil. She spent about a year in my laboratory. Um, in Puerto Rico, most of my students were Hispanic, a lot of students from Latin America. Here in Florida, I still have some students from Latin America, but also I've had the pleasure of also um, uh, mentoring students from China, India, and many other countries. And so that's been exciting for me because it's nice to learn about new cultures, which is also why I would have loved to visit all of you in Brazil. A little bit more. So this is where we're located. In case you ever want to visit, um, we're in Orlando. Uh, sorry, we're north of Orlando. Um, and so this is uh, what's called North Central Florida. It's a beautiful place. Uh, there's very nice um, nature, places to walk, a lot of state parks, um, uh, nature preserves, uh, springs where you can go kayaking or tubing. Um, and also a lot of breweries and a lot of arts and culture around because it's a major, you know, it's a major college town in the United States. So, so you would expect to find that. Um, my lab in general, we work with magnetic nanomaterials. We're interested in the, I've been interested in these materials since I was a, a grad student um, and I first saw a ferrofluid in action. Um, but our research has really um, moved away or Instead of being primarily focused on theoretical work, we, we do a lot of experimental and practical applied work these days. And the work spans the synthesis of nanomaterials, which I'll talk about today, 
formulation of these particles is drug carriers and imaging agents, and I'll be talking about imaging. We also do simulations of their response in dynamic magnetic fields. I'll show you some of that today. Um, we study their transport in biological environments, uh, diffusion in biological fluids like blood, serum, um, cytoplasm, synovial joint, joint fluids. We study their interactions with biological entities by co-culture, for example, with cells um, using various microscopy techniques. We're interested in their use as um, templating, scaffold, templating agents to generate scaffolds with aligned porosity so that they can be useful for tissue regeneration, for example, in the nerve. For many years, we've been interested in nanoscale thermal cancer therapy, which is a form of um, hyperthermia cancer therapy for, for using the magnetic nanoparticles. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that from, other, um, from others, uh, from Robert Ifkov to, uh, later today and tomorrow. And Rohan Fernandez will be talking about that, but instead of using magnetism, he'll be using um, photothermal type effects. And finally, more recently, we've been really focusing our efforts towards magnetic particle imaging, which is a topic of this tutorial. Um, before I, I finish talking about my group, I think it's important to recognize the people who actually do the work. And so this is a snapshot of my current group members. And there's several pictures missing because, you know, with the pandemic, it's been more difficult to see each other. And even if I took a picture right now, it would be, it would be with a mask, although I'm really looking forward to all of that opening up in the next few months here in the United States. Um, and so these are the people who do the work, and I'm very grateful for them to be in my group and give me the, you know, for the privilege of being their mentor. Okay, so why, why iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles for biomedical applications? And, um, you know, people have been using um, iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles for, for a variety of applications for decades. You know, actually, early applications date back to the early 1900s. But the interest in biomedical applications, I think, really, you know, it, it, it started with use in magnetic separations and magnetic contrast agents, uh, which was in the 70s and 80s, and then it really took off in the 1990s. And so I remember, you know, the early days of that literature. Like with many nanoparticles these days, they, the attractive properties of nanomaterials for biomedical applications are the ability to tune their size and surface chemistry. Um, and size is important here because many biological entities are in the nanoscale, right? In the, you know, one to 100 nanometer length scale. Also, if you can tune nanomaterials to be in that size range, you know, they, they can, in some cases, evade uh, or penetrate into tissues, right? But there's challenges with that. And I, I won't be talking too much about those challenges today. Um, with iron oxide magnetic nanoparticles, one of the attractive properties is that they're biocompatible and biodegradable. And we know that from past work uh, to translate them for, for um, clinical use. And it's important to recognize that when I say this, it's a general statement. Um, uh, and so we have to be a bit cautious with it, right? What it means is that the, the majority of the evidence that we see, the majority of the, of the work that's been done suggests that under, under certain conditions, you know, not too high concentration, et cetera, you won't see any negative effects because of the nanoparticles on cells or tissues. Also, the biodegradability comes from work that's shown the transformation of iron oxide into uh, you know, break down into iodine, which is then incorporated into hemoglobin and into um, ferritin in the body. And that was uh, work that was done in the early days of development of the magnetic contrast agents that I mentioned. But really, the reason why magnetic nanoparticles are attractive for biomedical applications is their magnetic response. And so among biomaterials, uh, I would argue that magnetic nanoparticles are somewhat unique because you can use magnetic fields that can penetrate deep in the body to actuate their, their movement, that you can actuate their rotation, you can actuate their translation, and under certain conditions, you can actuate their vibration, which can lead to uh, damage to local tissue or signal generation like an MPI. And so I'm going to classify some of these applications based on that magnetic response. And so the first idea is we apply a uniform magnetic field in a uniform magnetic field, we the particles do not experience the magnetic force from the field alone. They experience a magnetic torque that tends to align the dipole in the direction of the applied field. And if you if you have a high concentration of particles and the particles are close enough together, you will have dipole-dipole interactions that will cause the particles to aggregate with each other. 
And so this is um, this is the type of response that used in magnetic resonance imaging contrast generation. In MRI contrast, um, in first of all, in, in proton MRI, what we typically are looking at is the response of protons from water molecules and other um, moieties, other molecules in the body, to a to a pulsed field in the presence of a static high strength uh, DC field. And what happens then is that when you introduce an oxide particle, it aligns in the direction of the static field and distorts the magnetic field around it. And so any protons that are in the proximity of that particle will respond differently. And that's the mechanism of contrast generation. Uh, this can also be used in directed cell assembly and in magnetically temperate scaffolds by taking advantage of those dipole-dipole interactions that I referred to such that the particles um, or cells that have been labeled with particles align in chains, and that can be used uh, to generate a, an isotropic scaffold or tissue construct. Uh, the next idea is the use of a magnetic field gradient. And so a magnetic field gradient basically means that the strength of the magnetic field is varying with sp in space. And so the simplest situation that you can think of is the surface of a magnet. The surface of the magnet is going to have a very strong magnetic field, and that magnetic field is going to decay as you move away from the surface of the magnet. And so when you have a magnetic field gradient, there will be a force that um, drives the nanoparticle, the magnetic nanoparticle, towards region of strong magnetic fields. And so the particle is attracted to the surface of the magnet in very simple terms. And this is the, the type of response that's used, for example, in magnetic targeting. So in magnetic targeting, what you're trying to do is you're trying to apply an external magnetic field or use an implant to attract particles to a desired site in the body. For example, you want to deliver a drug and you want to improve the therapeutic index of the drug um, by increasing its concentration in the target site and decreasing its accumulation in other organs. One thing you could use is a magnetic field gradient to drive the particles to concentrate there. And this is something that's been studied for decades. It's a very interesting field. I won't be talking too much about it, um, but I, I, I certainly think it's an interesting application enabled by this magnetic response. Another example of the use of magnetic field gradients is in immunomagnetic separation. And so here, and this is widely used, um, there are several companies that have commercialized particles and separators for this. What we would have is a magnetic bead. It can be a micron-sized bead, but there's also use of uh, nanop nanoparticles for this. And it can be conjugated, say, to an antibody that binds to a cell of interest or to an analyte of interest. And then you use a magnetic field gradient to separate that out. Um, finally, there, and, and I think very importantly, there's also been several papers and, and several uh, people who reported the use of uh, magnetic buoyancy. And so here you have a magnetic field gradient. And the, the, what that generates from the point of view of the ferrofluid, right, the suspension of nanoparticles, is a pressure gradient. And that pressure gradient can be used to augment the buoyancy effect because of gravity. And so you can separate materials based on density differences or even based just on volume differences. And this has been used to separate circulating tumor cells um, without any labeling. Finally, and most relevant for, my, for the tutorial today is the response to alternating magnetic fields. And so here, um, it's either a uniform field, but it can also be a un non-uniform field, and it can be a uh, you know, it can be a combination of these fields. But the basic principle is that the, the magnitude of the field is changing in time and it's alternating in direction in the simplest case. You can also have rotating fields, but I'm just going to limit myself to alternating. And so when you do this, you, you cause dynamic magnetization response to the particle. And under certain conditions of field frequency and amplitude, you can convert some of that magnetic field energy to heat. Um, the, the response of magnetic nanoparticles to time varying or alternating fields can be used to monitor their diffusion. You can monitor their rotational diffusion. In fact, we've done a lot of work on that. You can also um, develop biomolecular sensing mechanisms where if the particle binds to an analyte, its response to the alternating field is going to change and that can be very easily detected uh, non-optically non using magnetic sensors. And so uh, others have demonstrated the use of this for biomolecular sensing. There's uh, the idea of thermal cancer therapy, where, again, you can convert some of that magnetic field energy to heat, and that can be used to destroy a tumor or to induce an immune response against tumor or to augment uh, or synergize with a drug. And, uh, and you'll hear more about that in the next two days, I'm sure. 
Um, more recently, people have reported the use of, you know, of these magnetic particles and their response to these alternating fields to rapidly rewarm cryopreserved organs. And so John Bischoff at Minnesota first reported this, and we've done some work in that field as well. You can also think of uh, a drug carrier that is thermally sensitive. Um, and let's say the, there's a drug that's been conjugated to the drug carrier with a thermally labile bond, or maybe it's a liposome that melts when you achieve a certain temperature. And so you can embed magnetic particles in that drug carrier and actuate release of the drug by actuating release of heat from the nanoparticle. And finally, uh, and this is the topic for today, is magnetic particle imaging. Now, I would be remiss to, to stop talking about why we're interested in biomedical applications of iron oxide nanoparticles without talking also about clinical applications that have already been established. And so oftentimes um, these days, people criticize nanotechnology um, because of a, uh, a perceived lack of clinical translation. And there are challenges and, and like when any new technology one could argue that there was a lot of overpromising in the beginning, but I would argue that there's also a lot of examples of success. In fact, uh, two of the COVID um, vaccines that are used right now are based on nanoparticle delivery technologies. In the case of iron oxide, there's several examples of successful clinical translation. And the first one that I've alluded to several times is the use of these particles as magnetic resonance imaging contrast agents. Um, but also, in, they are also used in iron supplementation therapy, where they are injected into the, into the bloodstream at relatively high dosage, and they're allowed to circulate, and they're broken down, and the body then um, you know, uses the iron in the particle to supplement um, uh, nutrition. In Europe, they've been approved for use in hyperthermia therapy and brain cancer, and I know that there's uh, at least one study here in the U.S. Uh, looking at their use in prostate. Um, and, and finally, in Europe, recently, they've been uh, recently approved for use in sentinel lymph node mapping in breast cancer. So, so this, these are all exciting applications. And the reason they're exciting is it's not because now we know that any application will work. It's more because we have a track record of being able to translate these iron oxide particles for clinical use. And so these past studies, I think, serve as a template or as a roadmap of what we would do, for example, if we developed a new MPI, a magnetic particle imaging tracer, and tried to translate it. OK, so let's talk about MPI proper. So MPI um, was first reported by Gleitchen Weisnicker in uh, 2005. It's a new biomedical imaging modality, and it relies, um, it, the single generation arises completely solely because of the nonlinear dynamic magnetization of the magnetic nanoparticles. And so I've sometimes I say it's a new imaging modality, and I say that it was first reported in 2005, and people balk at that because that's 16 years ago. And you have to uh, recognize that you know the, the the development of a new imaging modality for use in humans takes time. Um, you know what Leish and Weisnicker did is they reported the physical principles and and the first demonstration of an image. It takes time to then translate that vision that they had and that initial idea into working scanners at the preclinical and then eventually at the clinical level. The thing that people perhaps don't realize is that the last real um, major or new imaging modality that was developed was MRI, and that was um, in the 1970s, if I remember correctly. Um, and so it is a newcomer, I would say, into the biomedical imaging field. Um, MPI has several potential advantages. I've already alluded to the biocompatibility of the iron oxide nanoparticles themselves. From the point of view of an imaging technology, MPI is attractive because it's a non-invasive, tomographic, and quantitative imaging technology. Non-invasive meaning you don't have to you know, invade the body. You can image things from outside. Tomographic meaning that you can construct a three-dimensional image of the distribution of the tracer. And quantitative because the signal is directly proportional to the amount of particles in the, in the, in the location of interest. It's uh, highly sensitive. Um, 10 nanograms has been, it's, has been re reported with commercial preclinical scanners. And really, this can be even more sensitive if we develop tracers that are optimized for MPI. It has a negligible, negligible tissue background. The body does not generate a signal. You might wonder, what about magnetic materials in the body? Well, the, you know, the magnetic material that you would first think about is perhaps ferritin, which is uh, a small iron oxyhydroxide nanoparticle, and it has some superparamagnetism to it. But it turns out that because of the size of ferritin, it doesn't really generate a significant signal in the fields that are used for MPI. Um, 
there's negligible tissue signal attenuation, so the tissue does not affect the signal. Um, the tracers have long, tra long shelf life, meaning that once we synthesized a stable tracer, we can put it in the refrigerator, it can be there for a year, and its properties will be unchanged a year later. And this st stands in stark contrast to, for example, radioactive tracers for PET. Uh, finally, MPI does not use ionizing radiation. And in fact, the fields that are used are mild um, in terms of their strength. And so it doesn't really pose uh, significant um, health risks. Now, there's currently two commercial MPI preclinical scanners, one by Bruker and another one by Magnetic Insight. Uh, this is an example of a rotating rat head uh, where the, the, the rat has uh, particles circulating in the blood. And so you can see the major arteries. You can see smaller. Um, veins and arteries, um, the signal intensity is going to be proportional to the amount of particles in that region. And you can see a haze, and it's important to, or, to recognize that that's not tissue background. If there were no particles, you would just see a black image. Those are particles in the micro microcapillaries of the tissue. Uh, below, I show, I highlight one paper from 2019. Um, that has reported a clinical scale scanner. Um, I know uh, Grasser and others are, are very active in developing this. Um, and there's al also other groups. Magnetic Insight is developing a clinical scanner as well. And so is uh, Larry Wald at, at um, Harvard. And so we're really hopeful that, uh, you know, that in the future we'll see a lot of fast development of this technology. So, so why is MPI exciting? Why is it well suited? And here I'm going to talk about preclinical imaging. And, and I'm going to show you a comparison between MPI and IVIS, or optical fluorescence imaging, and magnetic resonance imaging. And this is from a paper from Connolly's group. And so here we have a, a mouse and uh, two capsules with the same concentration of iron oxide nanoparticles have been embedded into the body cavity of the mouse. We see computer tomography for anatomical reference of the bone structure. And in color, that's the MPI image. Those two capsules also have a fluorophore, and they have the same concentration of fluorophore in them. And they're located, they're embedded at different depths in the tissue. And here's an optical image, an IVIS image of the same mouse. And what I hope you can easily appreciate is that even though I told you the two capsules have the same amount of fluorophore, the, the signal uh, that's obtained, that is detected from the two capsules is very different. And the difference in depth between the two capsules is only about two millimeters. And so this shows a significant exponential tissue attenuation of the optical signal from the fluorophore. Uh, finally, this is an, uh, an MRI scan. So the iron oxide particles produce contrast in MRI. What a lot of people uh, perhaps don't appreciate is that under most conditions, for most particles, for most iron oxide particles, for most uh, scanning sequences that you would use, M, uh, nano, iron oxide nanoparticles are what are called negative contrast agents in MRI, meaning that they show up as a dark spot. And so we know that this is where we put, or they know, you know, that this is where they put the capsule. And we see a dark spot because of the capsule located there. We also see some imaging artifacts that are often associated to having iron oxide nanoparticles in a T2 contrast image. However, I hope you also appreciate that there's a lot of other dark spots. And some of them have similar um, image artifacts, you know, high intensity spots around them. For example, where you have um, air uh, tissue interfaces. And so what this shows is that, you know, Unless you know that you would never have such an artifact in a tissue of interest, or unless you take an image before and an image after um, administration of the iron oxide, uh, MRI is uh, somewhat an ambiguous in terms of being able to track iron oxide. It's also not um, very sensitive and, and quantitative in terms of uh, characterizing. And so here MPI has the advantages of no tissue penetrate, no tissue attenuation, and, on, uh, and being unambiguous for the iron oxide particles. To further drive this home, this is from the same paper. Here's uh, an example. They're, they have two capillaries, and one capillary has an iron oxide, and the other capillary has a fluorophore. And they've been located um, under slices of tissue, which uh, I'm told were really thin slices of, of meat um, obtained at a grocery store. Um, and so these are different depths of the two probes. And this is the MPI image. You can see that the MPI image is the same regardless of the, of the, of the thickness of, of tissue that is on top of the probe. This is the fluorescence image uh, for the same series of samples. And, and here you can see significant attenuation. And here they plot the signal, maximum signal, uh, in logarithmic uh, coordinates versus tissue thickness. 
and you see no change um, in the MPI signal, but you see a straight line change for the optical signal, and that's because attenuation of optical signal is going to be exponential in tissue. And it is exponential regardless of the wavelength that you're looking at. Um, as long as you're in the visible ultraviolet and, and IR wavelength, it's going to be exponential decay. The only thing that happens, the changes is that depending on the wavelength for excitation and emission, the slope of the exponential is going to be different because that's associated with the um, with the absorption of, of light by the tissue, and that's going to change with frequency. So, so it is inescapable that it's going to be in, the, in, in a, an exponential decay. And you know that I'm, I don't want to knock um, this too much. Um, I think optical imaging with fluorophores um, is, ex is extremely exciting. Um, it has a lot of advantages. A lot of things that MPI can't do, you can do with those. Um, it, it just illustrates, you know, some of the advantages of MPI over other established imaging techniques that are widely used. So let's talk about the the development of the field in terms of um, scanners around the world. And so again, this is uh, first paper came out in 2005 by Glacian Weisnecker. Um, uh, the first, you know, not the first, but you know, one of the early papers from the Berkeley group by Steve Connolly um, was in around 2012 reporting a preclinical scale scanner. And the difference here is that in you know the Berkeley group developed a modality called XSpace MPI, whereas um, I'm going to call Harmonic um, Space MPI or Harmonic MPI for what Glacian Weisnecker. Although you know, in fact, we could just say MPI, and we would be referring to their work. Around 2014, uh, Bruker commercialized uh, and installed the first um, preclinical scanner. Um, this was in Germany. Another one was installed in 2015. Another another two in 2016. And around 2016, uh, Magnetic Insight, which was a spin-off out of Berkeley, um, uh, as, uh, you know, put their first uh, prototype scanner in Stanford University. 2017, they, you know, Magnetic Insight installed one in China, and then in 2018, Bruker installed another one in Germany. Magnetic Insight installed two in the in in North America, one in in Michigan, and the other one in Canada. And then in 2019, another three instruments were installed, and that includes ours here at the University of Florida, and two more in China. In 2020, there was another instrument by Bruker in, in Germany as well, or in, in, in Europe, sorry. And, um, and then another instrument in Australia from Magnetic Insight. And then he, now in 2021, things have slowed down in the last year because of the pandemic, but in 2021, I'm told that Magnetic Insight expects to install another five instruments. And so all told, this is the distribution around the world. There's um, This is only for the commercial scanners. Um, uh, in addition to that, you have the, the scanner, the prototype scanners at Berkeley. But for the commercial scanners, there's 14 installations already, and five more are coming in 2021. Uh, there's none in um, South America or Central America. And so Florida is the closest, I would I would say, um, to, to Brazil, for example. Um, but you know, I see I see this continuing to grow. I'm very hopeful. This is an exciting time, I think, to be working in MPI. So in our case, we were very fortunate to be able to install an, an instrument um, here in 2019. And this was a major investment by biomedical engineering and the College of Engineering, um, with some contributions from other departments. And so this is our laboratory. Here's our momentum scanner. And it's co-located with a Perkin Elmer Spectrum IVIS Micro CT. And the advantage is that we've designed 3D printed sample beds and animal beds that are compatible with both instruments. And so we can go from one instrument to another, take images, and then register those images together so we can have anatomical reference from CT, MPI, and we can also, in principle, look at co-registration with the optical image, say, if you had a fluorescently labeled uh, cell, for example. Now, that's complemented by extensive instrumentation at the University of Florida for physical chemical nanoparticle characterization and also uh, extensive magnetic characterization instrumentation, including squid magnetometers, custom magnetic relaxometers, and also instrumentation to characterize magnetic heating. And here I'm showing you four of the faculty who are involved in this. You know, you can see my face there. Uh, but also Kyle Allen is interested in the use of MPI in the context of arthritis. So is Blanca Sharma, also, although she's also more broadly interested in drug delivery. And Lakeisha Williams um, is interested in the use for traumatic brain injury. Now, MPI is still in a young field. It's still developing. And so this is a search in Web of Science um, for papers with the keywords magnetic particle imaging since 2004. 
And so uh, that yields about 540 papers. And you know, there, we're talking last year it was about 80 papers that were published. The vast majority of these papers, I would argue, are about uh, developing hardware and software and analysis for MPI. So it's more the hardware, more hardware and software development. But more recently, as the number of preclinical scanners has grown around the world, um, you're seeing more and more papers reporting new particles and papers reporting new applications. And here's a few examples. And um, I, I have to apologize to people in the field if I don't uh, highlight their work. I have to acknowledge that I am highlighting a, lot, highlighting a lot of work from Steve Connolly's group because Steve and I have collaborated and I know more about their, their work um, than some of others. Um, but also I think that these are really beautiful images and so I like to highlight them. And so for example, this is um, one of, I think the first paper on using MPI to monitor nanoparticle tumor accumulation. And so here you can see for a single um, animal over a span of 24 hours, they took several images. You see the bone from CT for anatomical reference. The tumor is down here, and you can see you know, no signal in the beginning, an accumulation, increase. I think it peaks between 9 and 12 hours, and then washing out. And so what you can see is the full dynamic of nanoparticle accumulation in the tumor and then washing out of the tumor. You can also see, you know, at first the particles are circulating, so you can see them in the heart, and eventually you see them accumulating in the liver and in the spleen. This one is, uh, I think, the, the first paper on imaging in traumatic brain injury, and although this was a very small pilot study, it's still an interesting um, study because here you have a control animal. This is the site of the injury, so the, this control animal did not receive an injury. You don't see any signal. This animal received an injury, and um, immediately after injury, you can see a significant signal in, of particle accumulation there. Also, interestingly, three days later in the control, they see some signal in what they say are the uh, sentinel lymph nodes for the area. But three days later, in the case of the uh, injury, you can still see particles remaining in the site of injury, but you can also see a more significant signal in the lymph node. Um, there's another example from Connolly's group. This is uh, an example of detecting gut bleeding. So it's an example of the use of MPI for monitoring internal hemorrhaging. And so in this case, uh, what you're seeing is this is a mouse that, that is such that it's a mouse model for, for um, hemorrhaging or bleeding in the gut. This is the image, uh, the full image taken at 115 uh, minutes. And you can see particles are still circulating, but you see a significant signal in the gut. This is after uh, image subtraction. They subtract the initial image, which would correspond to the particles distributing in the whole body. And what you see is a very clear indication of particle accumulation in the gut. In the control animal, the wild type animal that doesn't have the bleeding, um, you see the signal in the heart, some signal in the gut area. But once you do subtraction, you see no signal in the gut. And so you can clearly differentiate those two. And then finally, for last example, this is an example of tracking an aerosol inhalation situation where now the particles are not being delivered uh, systemically via the blood, but they're being inhaled by the animal. And you can see particle accumulation in, in the lungs, basically. OK, so, so that's an introduction to MPI. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the physics of signal generation in MPI. Now, to do that, I first have to uh, uh, give a very brief uh, introduction into superparamagnetism. And so let's talk about paramagnetism and superparamagnetism. And so in paramagnetism, we're talking about individual atoms uh, or molecules, um, where the, the atoms or molecules are such that you have unpaired electrons, and these electrons have magnetic spin, and so um, they would be magnetic, right? But in the absence of an external field, thermal energy is such that it randomizes the orientations of all the, the atoms, all the dipoles of the molecules and atoms. If you apply a magnetic field, though, you will be applying a magnetic torque. And so the torque is such that it wants to align the particles in the direction of the magnetic field. And I illustrated that here by, you know, it still looks kind of random, but if you actually sort of vector sum all the dipoles, you'll see that there is a slight net dipole. There is a positive dipole in the direction of the field. And so this is the situation with paramagnetism. In super paramagnetism, what we typically have are single domain or you, know, you have magnetic domains. Um, and typically, what you want to achieve are single domain magnetic nanoparticles. And within the crystal, within the domains, you have magnetic ordering. And so all the dipoles because of the atoms, in this case, iron atoms in the iron oxide, 
the dipoles are are coupled to each other. Now, I'm illustrating it there as all of them pointing in the same direction. It turns out that the situation in, in magnetite is a bit more complicated. It's actually a ferry magnet with some alternating dipoles, but let's forget about that and just focus on the idea that here, you have thousands, thousands of atoms, the dipoles of thousands of atoms all pointing in the same direction. And so all of them um, are behaving in unison. And so this can be represented by a very large dipole. And, and here I'm being purposeful Although I'm not actually illustrating the magnitude difference, I'm being purposeful in saying, you know, the magnetic domain has a much larger dipole than the individual atoms in the case of a power magnet. Now we can describe this. There's theories to describe this. Uh, so Langevin uh, developed a theory for paramagnetism. It turns out it's also the theory we use for describing super paramagnetism. And so basically here, what you consider is a balance between magnetic energy wanting to align the dipole in the direction of the field and thermal energy wanting to randomize the dipole directions. Now, if we solve the for the orientation distribution of all the dipoles, um, considering only the balance of those two things, and we then calculate what the average magnetic magnetization or average dipole would be for that collection, we get the so-called Langevin function, um, hyperbolic cotangent of alpha minus one over alpha, uh, and that's multiplied by the number density of particles and the strength of the dipole. And so this can be, sorry, the number density of, for example, atoms or molecules in the paramagnet or of magnetic domains in the case of the single domain particles. And this is the magnetic dipole of each of those entities. Alpha here is a so-called Langevin parameter, and it is the ratio of the magnitude of the magnetic field energy to the thermal energy. And so when we have a, when we talk about a small field, what we're really talking about is a field such that alpha is much less than one. And when we talk about a large field, we're talking about a field that is such that alpha is close to, is very large. Now, there are two interesting limits for the Langevin function. One is the low field limit, and the other one is the high field limit. And so in the low field limit, the Langevin function reduces to a linear relationship between the magnetization and the magnetic field, where the linear proportionality constant is the initial susceptibility. And the initial susceptibility then depends on the number density of dipoles or magnetic domains uh, and the dipole strength divided by the thermal energy. And this is only for small fields. In the other limit, um, we, we eventually reach a situation where the uh, dipoles, the magnetization saturates. And you can imagine that um, if all the arrows are pointing in the same direction, eventually you can't really increase the net dipole. And so that, that means they're saturated. And you can obtain an expression for the saturating field um, uh, according to this model. And what's important here, uh, it's an order of magnitude proportionality, so let's not focus too much on the 10. What's important is really that it's the ratio of thermal energy to the magnetic dipole. Now, if we consider individual atoms versus uh, magnetic domain, say in an iron oxide particle, the magnetic dipole of a typical atom will be in the order of a Bohr magneton and the magnetic dipole of, say, a 10 nanometer spion will be in the order of 25,000 Bohr magnetons. And so what you get out of that is that the saturating field for a paramagnet is in the order of thousands of Tesla. So it's not practically achievable um, for anything that we can do on Earth. And so that means that a paramagnet, even though it follows the Langevin um, theory, it's only going to show you the linear magnetization response versus a 10 nanometer iron oxide it saturates in a field of about 0.2 tesla, which is certainly feasible and exp experimentally. Also, if you compare the initial susceptibilities, right, this proportionality, the ratio between that of an iron oxide versus a, a, a paramagnet atom or molecule is really big. And so this is why we call them super paramagnets. Now, the, the typical uh, characterization curve you'll see in the literature is something like this. So this is a magnetization curve. And the key features here is a linear response at small fields with a very large high slope saturation at high fields and it's not easily visible so it would be nice so okay, you can we'll hear. be able to take a break and then people can ask some questions and then i'll keep going he's trying to fix here right now Saying I have a collaborator in in Ninja. He's he's telling me if he's he's facing some problems there. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so we we just returned, Carlos. I'm okay. sorry for that. No, it's fine. So I'll just redo this slide from the beginning. Okay, so uh, I was told that we had some connection issues, so I'll start again with this slide. And um, what I was um, saying when we started was that when you're generate when you're going to generate a signal, you're going to apply a, a uniform alternating magnetic field throughout a region, a field of view, a region of interest, and there's going to be particles dispersed there. Uh, however, in this case, all the particles respond to the field, and so all the particles generate a signal. And we cannot use this to generate an image because we can't tell which region in the field of view is responsible for the signal. So we superimpose a, a quasi-static or very slowly varying selection magnetic field gradient. And that selection magnetic field gradient is such that um, there's a small region where the, the selection field gradient is very small, small compared to the excitation field, meaning that the blue field is small compared to the red field. And then outside that region, the, the selection field increases very dramatically. And so outside that region, this, the blue field is going to be much stronger than the red field. And what will happen is that if you now redistribute the particles, the particles that are in the field-free region are able to respond to the excitation field, and the particles that are outside the field-free region uh, don't really respond much and um, because they're saturated in the direction of the blue field. Um, we, we can also think about this. So we're going to generate a signal based on, we're going to detect the signal based on um, uh, coils, uh, sensing coils, so Faraday coupling of the signal of the magnetization with the, with the wind time. And so you can think of uh, using a Fourier transform. And so if you take a Fourier transform of this behavior, the behavior from the particles in the field-free region, you'll see that you have a lot of harmonics because it's nonlinear response. You have the fundamental, which is in the same frequency as the excitation field, and then you have higher harmonics. In the case of the particles that are outside the field-free region, you also have a Fourier transform, but it's a much weaker signal than the, the region, the field-free region. And so what we do next is we're going to filter out the fundamental harmonic. And we filter out the fundamental harmonic because in the detecting, detection coils, not only will there be a signal from the particles in the fundamental harmonic, but there will also be a signal because of the excitation field. Also, it turns out that any paramagnetic or diamagnetic material in the body is going to be generating a signal in the fundamental harmonic. And so by filtering it out and only using the higher harmonics, only using the nonlinear magnetization part of the response, we can eliminate any tissue background. Now, when we talk about particle characterization for MPI, we can talk about their harmonic spectrum and their point spread function. And these matter depending on which modality you're using. Uh, for uh, regular MPI or harmonic spectrum MPI, you want a particle that has a very slow decay in the harmonic spectrum, you want uh, higher harmonics to be strong, so you get a lot of signal. In X-space MPI, um, the an analog of this is really a point spread function, if you will, where the height of the peak corresponds to sensitivity and the width of the peak corresponds to resolution. Now, that Langevin model that I mentioned before can be used to predict the behavior of particles under certain assumptions. And in such a case, uh, the Langevin model predicts that the sensitivity is going to scale, or the signal strength is going to scale with the number density of particles, the domain magnetization of the particles, and the magnetic volume of the particle. And resolution is going to scale with thermal energy divided by the domain magnetization and the magnetic volume, and also by the, gra the gradient strength. And so these, um, these very simple equations provide some guidance when you're trying to design magnetic particles for MPI. But it's very important to point out that they have several limitations. And so this, these models do not account for the effects of magnetic relaxation. They do not account for dipole-dipole interactions. And they do not account for particle polydispersity. So again, you know, this is the X, you know, for X space MPI, you have the point spread function. Intensity is going to is going to be proportional or uh, dependent on the height of this peak. Resolution dependent on the full width at half maximum in a way. Um, and, and again, with those models, you can sort of think, well, if I want really high resolution particles, uh, let's say I have a 50 nanometer particle. If I increase the gradient strength, I get better resolution. If I want a better particle, I have to make them larger and larger and larger. Now, the problem, again, is that as they become larger, we, we no longer follow the assumptions. 
Specifically, as the particles become larger, um, you start getting significant effects because of magnetic relaxation. Now, I think this is a good point to stop for a few minutes. I've been speaking for about 40, um, and, um, and I've given you the basic physics and a basic introduction to MPI. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have now before I move on to the more advanced parts of the tutorial. Guys, questions, please put in the in the chat there in, in YouTube, please. Hi, Carlos. We are waiting for the people to include the questions in the in YouTube. So I will transfer to you as soon as. Yeah, we'll wait a few minutes, and if there's no questions by 10.05, I'll just keep going. And if any questions come up while I'm talking about the next section, just interrupt me. Okay. There is a delay there. There might be a delay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing that there is a delay. I'm seeing the, the video in YouTube too, Carlos. And oh, okay. it, it, I'm hearing like something that we talked like one minute ago. <laughs> oh, okay. But yeah, that's, that's fine. That's a problem with the connection, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't have the uh, the YouTube site open, so I'm not looking at that. I think it would be too confusing. It is. <laughs> Well, by the time that they put, uh, they include some questions there, maybe I can ask you uh, one thing for you to, to discuss a little yeah, bit. I, I remember that you were, were talking about uh, an image of gut accumulation in the gut. And yeah. as far as I remember, maybe uh, could you talk a little bit about what kind of surface coating that the people were using? Is this important for this kind of application? For, yes, uh, yeah. surface surface coatings are very important. It it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. I don't remember the details of that paper. I'm going to venture to guess because of the nature of the results that that was a peg coated particle. Um, I don't remember which particles, but a lot of these papers from the Connolly group were done with um, some particles synthesized by load spin and Kanan Krishnan's lab and coated with polymalic and hydride uh, conjugated to polyethylene glycol. And those particles, if I remember correctly, in mice had a circulation half-life of about 90 minutes, um, and it was a longer half-life in rats. And so, yeah, in a gut bleed, it's an interesting question because in a gut bleed application or in a, a hemorrhaging application, one idea is you want something that will very quickly extravasate if you have bleeding but then very quickly clear from the body. So you have no, so your contrast is very strong because you don't have any circulating particles anymore. And, and the only thing you see are the particles that are accumulated. But um, you can also, if you have a very stable tracer, you can also do image subtraction, right? So you can take an image immediately after injecting before particles accumulate and then subtract that from an image, say an hour or two later, which is what they did in the gut bleed paper. So I think um, there's a lot of room and that's what I think is exciting because um, I didn't say this, uh, in, but I'll say it in, in a few slides. You know, basically the physics are similar to the physics of hyperthermia, but you want different particles. So you don't necessarily want the same types of particles. The physics are certainly different from MRI. Um, but the surface chemistry is a lot of concepts that we've already developed for MRI imaging agents. You know they're equally applicable here, so there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for work. Um, I think in the surface coding space. Any questions from the chat? If not, I'm going to keep going. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> there is a question here. That, let me just read here. Uh, there is a question from Annie Gabriela. Do you have other ways to experiment without using animals? If not, why not? That's a question that I have here. Uh, 
Another other ways to experiment without using animals. I mean, the you can use MPI for other things. Like for example, MRI has been used to study flow uh, in porous media. And I think you could use MPI for such an application as well. And I think it would have cert certain advantages. But um, unfortunately, if you're trying to develop an imaging modality that will be used for humans, the first step is to do animal experimentation. Now, I'm not going to talk about that today, but I can put in some slides about it tomorrow. Um, we we have been we have developed 3D printable anatomically correct mouse phantoms that can be used to reduce the number of animals used in experiments. So, in many animal experiments, you have to do some pilot studies, and you have and with image with a new imaging modality, you're also trying to figure out what is the best way, what are the best conditions to take an image. You're trying to figure out what is the best way to analyze an image, and here um, having a phantom a non-living um, system that mimics the geometry of the disease you want to image is very advantageous because you can do a lot of work without having to use animals. And so we've developed those. I can show that tomorrow. We're working on the paper, so that's, that hasn't been published. And once the paper is published, our plan is to put the, the 3D printer files so that any, anybody can use it. You know. Any other questions? Thanks. So far, uh, I don't know if it is a, a problem of delay, as I told you. Uh, That's okay. So I would encourage anyone, you know, just post questions, and um, I'll try to answer them as I keep going. But it's already 10:08, so I'm going to move on. Or and my time is 10:08, um, so we're already an hour and 10 minutes into the period. So I'm going to keep going and hopefully uh, be able to, to to talk to you about the more complex things here. Okay. So so let's talk about um, when I. When I stopped um, for the break, uh, the last thing I had shown you was a very simple model based on on the Langevin function, um, and that had certain assumptions to them. You know, assumptions. The basic assumptions were that there's no relaxation effects, there's no particle-particle interactions, and there's no polydispersity. And and now I'm going to talk to you about um, relaxation effects and how that informs synthesis of better particles for MPI. And I will talk to you about uh, interaction effects. I'm not going to talk about polydispersity. Okay, so so let's talk about dynamic magnetization and magnetic relaxation and its role in magnetic particle imaging. And when we talk about um, magnetic relaxation, what it really means is that um, in in the ideal case for the Langevin model um, that I showed you, the assumption is that the particles respond to the applied field instantaneously. Um, but that's not true. And certainly, as the particles become larger, there is going to be a lag, just like we're having right now with YouTube. There's going to be a lag between the, the driving field and the particle response. And that lag can significantly degrade imaging in MPI. And so I'm going to talk about that now. So there's, um, there's several papers on this. I'm not going to go over them. I'm just going to go over a few highlighted papers. Um, and that illustrate how relaxation can have an impact on MPI. And so this is an example with, uh, with the XSpace MPI. I'm going to focus on XSpace MPI now. Um, and these are point spread functions. Um, the black dotted line is the ideal, according to the Langevin model. You will notice that the peak is at a zero field strength and that it's symmetric. The blue is the measured response of these particles from the University of Washington. And UWASH 20 means that they were 20 nanometer particles. And these were not the best particles. This is just an illustration. Um, and it's a good illustration because there's significant relaxation. You can see that the peak location has shifted from 0. So it's not the peak is not at 0. Uh, the other thing you can see is that the peak is no longer symmetric. And so what that translates to, um, is a de degradation of, of resolution, for example, and also a shifting of the image when you create an image using MPI. And so this is a very early example. Here's um, in this paper, they fitted the response to a heuristic or phenomenological model for relaxation. And they show that, you know, basically for different particle sizes, you have different relaxation times, and that the larger particles had 
very large relaxation times at low fields and that relaxation time decrease with the field amplitude, which is something that's well known in the ferrofluid literature that um, particle relaxation times are gonna vary with applied field amplitude. Um, this is an example of our own work. So this is theoretical work uh, or modeling work um, where we solve the ferro, I think this was with the, this was with using Brownian dynamic simulations for the particle response. Here it's old nomenclature, so adiabatic means that it's ideal, meaning that there's no relaxation. Non-adiabatic means that there is relaxation. And here I'm illustrating, you know, we're going from a saturating field in one direction to a saturating field in another direction. In the ideal case, the magnetic particle, the dipole of the particle flips very quickly. In the non-ideal case with relaxation, there is a lag between flipping and, you know, field flipping and magnitude of magnetization flipping. That translates to a signal that, again, has been shifted from the time of flipping and also that becomes asymmetric. If you analyze this from the point of view of the peak and the full width at half maximum, what this um, suggests is that in the absence of relaxation, which are the open red symbols, you have this dependence of particle signal on size. And in the presence of relaxation, you have a much weaker dependence. So whereas you would have expected from this size to this size an improvement in ten of sevenfold intensity, you only get about a twofold improvement if you account for relaxation. Similarly, in the absence of relaxation, you get you know very good resolution as you go to large particle sizes, but you get very poor resolution when you have relaxation effects. Um, this was later, I, I think there's a, this is a really neat paper from the Connolly group. They have a neat title as well. Um, and here they, they probe this, they, they study this experimentally. And what they're doing is they're taking particles in a size range of about 19 to 32 nanometers, and they're, me they're measuring their point spread function and calculating the full width at half maximum. And, um, and here red is the smallest particle and um, this um, magenta is the largest particle. And I hope you appreciate that you can see that as the particles become larger, the peak location is shifting, and also the peak is becoming asymmetric and broader. And in this paper, they, they call this, the, uh, they, they, they coined the term the relaxation wall. And what they're talking about is that as you increase particle size, you get improvement in, M in MPI performance, but eventually relaxation takes over and you cannot get past that and you don't get a, a further improvement. You actually get a degradation in performance. And that's illustrated here um, because they have in red the Langevin model saying that resolution will improve as you increase particle core diameter. And here you have the experiments. You see, you see some improvement in resolution, but then as you hit a size of about 25, the resolution gets worse. And they, they refer to this as the relaxation wall. Now, uh, what I think the main message I want to come I want to come across in in the next few slides is that this is incontrovertible. There is a relaxation wall. Eventually, you will get significant relaxation and degradation of performance. But the important point I think is that the location of that wall, the di the diameter for which that wall happens, is going to depend on many things. And so it is not simply twenty five nanometers, like for example they they say in this paper which is what they see in their experiment. It's going to depend on, on many, many things. OK, so let's talk about dynamic magnetization. So now we're going to do a bit more theory. Uh, here, I'm going to use the phenomenological magnetization relaxation equation to explain this. Uh, and the same, everything I'm going to show you can also be obtained from more complex models like the um, uh, Fokker-Planck or Schmolhausky approaches. And so here, this equation says that the rate of change of the magnetization is going to depend on the difference between the instantaneous magnetization and some equilibrium magnetization with the applied field. And there's going to be a proportionality constant that is the inverse of the so-called relaxation time. If we apply a sinusoidal field, you know, something described by a cosine, for example, uh, and the field is weak, such that the Langevin parameter is small, the same Langevin parameter from before, you get a linear response. Uh, you get what's called the Debye model, if you will. And it basically says that you have an in-phase and an out-of-phase component and the in-phase and out-of-phase components are going to depend on relaxation time, frequency, and initial susceptibility. What you get is something like this. Um, when you plot magnetization versus time, or when you plot magnetization versus field. 
If you apply a strong magnetic field, the solution is actually a, a, a Fourier series. And so you have a series of, um, of Fourier coefficients. And what you get is a nonlinear response. The, the field is varying sinusoidally, but the magnetization is no longer a clean sinusoid. It's more it's getting closer and closer to a square wave. If you plot the dynamic magnetization versus field, you get something that looks like an open hysteresis loop. And this is uh, a, a, you know, an interesting thing because uh, the particles are still super paramagnetic. They're, they're super paramagnetic with a relaxation time that can be described with theory from Niel, for example. And yet their magnetization curve, their dynamic magnetization curve shows open hysteresis. This, this does not mean that there is coercivity and remanence. It simply means that we're, we're plotting an instantaneous magnetization against an instantaneous field and we're not allowing things to reach equilibrium. That's, that's what it means. So what that translates to is that in the, in the linear uh, regime, you have uh, only the first harmonic, and in the nonlinear regime, you have a lot of harmonics. I don't know why this is repeated, so I apologize. So I'm just going to keep going. OK, so where does that relaxation time come from? So there's two, two main mechanisms. This slide is a bit disorganized, so I apologize. There's two main mechanisms that you can think about, that we can think about in terms of that um, dipole changing direction towards the applied field. And so the first is going to be internal dipole rotation, or so-called Niel relaxation. And so here, there is, you know, the, the, the white arrow is the instantaneous dipole. And the red arrow uh, corresponds to a direction along the crystal axis, a, 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 a specific crystal axis direction that corresponds to the lowest energy state. So that if the dipole is aligned in the so-called EC axis, its magneti magnetic anisotropy energy or magnetocrystalline energy is minimum. If you, if you move the dipole out of alignment with the EC axis, you will have to pay an energy price. And so in the simplest case of uniaxial, which is what I'm illustrating here, um, uh, anisotropy, you have minimum, minimum energy at zero and at 90 degrees, and then you have an energy barrier between them. And that energy barrier is going to depend on the so-called anisotropy constant, which is a physical property of the composition of the particles and the size of the particles. And there is a model by Brown, um, not the same Brown from Brown Motion, another Brown. There is a model that, that can describe the characteristic time for the dipole to flip from one EC axis direction to the other. And that is the so-called Neil relaxation time, which depends on a flipping time scale uh, in the order of 10 to the minus 9 seconds times the exponential of the ratio of the magnetocrystalline energy barrier to the thermal energy. And so if this energy barrier is very large, or let's say that initially it's small, but as the particle size increases, eventually the numerator in the argument of the exponential, the numerator is going to be larger than the denominator. And when that happens, you'll get very large relaxation times. And so eventually, as the particles become larger and larger, the Niel relaxation time increases, meaning that the particles respond are, it's more, it's more sluggish. The other possibility is physical particle rotation. So here, the dipole is now fixed in a crystal axis direction. But because the particle is suspended in a liquid, the particle can rotate. Now, we call this Brownian relaxation because it's attributed to Brownian diffusion, rotational Brownian diffusion. So, and, and this is in the, both of these um, ideas or concepts and the equations are in the situation where the, there is negligible applied field. So in Brownian relaxation, that relaxation time is going to depend on the hydrodynamic volume and the viscosity. And so the magnetic volume is going to be related to the size of the core, although it's not precisely the same. And the hydrodynamic volume is going to be related to the size of the core plus whatever coating you have in it. You will notice that here we have an exponential of the volume, and here we just have the volume. And so what you can imagine is that these two uh, relaxation times, their dependence on size is going to vary. It's going to be different. And so here I'm illustrating, um, uh, as a cartoon, the effect of particle size on relaxation time. And this is in logarithmic scale, um, although there's no number, so it's illustrative. So this is the Niel relaxation time. At very small, uh, sm very small particle sizes, the, relaxa the Niel relaxation time is much smaller than the Brownian relaxation time. But it very rapidly grows as particle size increases. On the other hand, the Brownian relaxation time grows, but it grows more gradually. 
And so what will happen is that there will be a transition diameter below which near relaxation is faster and above which Brownian relaxation is faster. And so the particle will respond by the faster of the two mechanisms. So if the particles are smaller than this diameter, they respond by Niel. And if the particles are larger than this transition diameter, they respond by the Brownian mechanism. At the transition, there is a relationship. I'm not going to talk too much about it. There's some assumptions and limitations to this. It's only applicable for very low fields. Again, it neglects particle-particle interactions, and it neglects surface and shape anisotropy. But I think the important thing is that at small particle diameters, this time scale is going to be in the order of nanoseconds. And so the 20 kilohertz fields that are used in MPI are very slow. So the particles respond, quote unquote, instantaneously. But as the particle size becomes larger, eventually this becomes in the order of milliseconds. And when that's the case, the relaxation time is in the same order as the, as the characteristic time of the applied excitation field. And then you're going to have significant effects from relaxation. And you can see that illustrated here. here There's a complicated graph, so I'm going to try to walk you through it. In red, I'm plotting the Niel relaxation times, and I'm plotting them for two values of the anisotropy constant, one order of magnitude representative of magnetite, one order of magnitude representative of cobalt ferrite. And in blue, I'm showing you the Brown relaxation times for a wide range of viscosities. This low, the lowest viscosity here is water. And so biological fluids will be in, in the order of these, these viscosities here, the lower ones. What you see is that for magnetite, for example, in water, that transition can happen according to these models uh, at a size of about seven nanometers. That's not accurate, but you know, it gives you an idea. If the viscosity were uh, larger, that transition would happen at a slightly larger diameter. On the, on the uh, you know, below this size, the particles are, are neat. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. This one's magnetite. <laughs> That's why it doesn't make sense. So this is magnetite. So below a size of about 15 nanometers, magnetite would be Niel. Above that, it would be Brownian. And for cobalt ferrite, um, it would have to be a particle smaller than about 7 nanometers for it to respond by the Niel mechanism. Um, polydispersity also matters. And so uh, relaxation time, like I pointed out, size dependence. Nanoparticles are never monodispersed. Uh, and depending on the size distribution and other properties, they could have both Brian and Niel relaxation. And so here I'm illustrating a particle size distribution. Um, let's say that these particles have an anisotropy constant of 10 kilojoules per cubic meter. So that would be this curve here. Below this size, the particles are Niel. Above this size, the particles are Brownian. And so here, um, I'm just we're just showing, we're shading this region of the size distribution responds by the Niel mechanism, and this region of the size distribution responds by the Brownian mechanism. And so what, what I hope this illustrates is that depending on how polydispersed your particles are, and depending on the value of that anisotropy constant, you could have situations where, let's say that the anisotropy constant is very small, this curve here. Basically, this is the transition regime. All the particles respond by the Niel mechanism. Let's say that the anisotropy constant is very large, this value here, which would be this curve. In this case, all the particles above this size are Brownian, so all these particles would be Brownian. But if it's an intermediate anisotropy constant, you can have a mixture of particles that are Brownian and particles that are Niel. And all of this is going to impact their MPI properties. And so it's very important, I think, for MPI that we not only strive to obtain um, uh, particles with tunable size, but that, we, that they're as monodispersed as possible, and also that we take into consideration the importance of having particle response be faster than the characteristic time of the drive field. Another important point I want to I wanna, uh, mention is that we often um, focus on physical size. And so here, this is actual data, and I'll get back to this data in a later slide. This is physical size for, for a certain magnetic particle of about 20 nanometers. You can see in red, the physical size distribution is very narrow. Particles are relatively more dispersed at 20 nanometers. In green is actually the magnetic diameter size distribution, which I'll explain in a few minutes. And, and what I want to point out is that it is the magnetic diameter that is responsible for the magnetic response that gives rise to an image or a signal in MPI. And so having a particle that has very monodispersed physical size but has very poor distribution and magnetic properties is not advantageous for MPI. Um, I want to 
stop for a minute and and tell you about the anisotropy constant, which I've been mentioning a lot. And and this value, uh, there's a value for bulk magnetite, but it can be determined experimentally for for iron oxide. And I want to point out that the value you obtain is going to depend on the preparation method. And so we've shown that in this paper, where depending on the concentration of particles in the sample, you start getting in significant dipole-dipole interactions. And you'll see anisotropy constants that uh, vary by orders of magnitude. And it's the same particles. And what this tells you is that the preparation method is influencing the property you're obtaining. We, we wrote a book chapter a couple of years ago where we go over a lot of methods of magnetic characterization of iron oxide nanoparticles, and we explain how we like to approach it. And I'm going to show you some results for that paper from the, you know, from that group uh, from the relaxation wall paper. You can obtain an isotropy constant from a zero fuel cool fuel cooled curve by looking at the blocking temperature. And now we often attribute the peak of the zero fuel cooled curve as the blocking temperature. And we say that that's the temperature at which 50% of the particles are blocked. I want to point out that that's a, a very uh, uh, overt simplification of the physics. And there's some nice papers by Karen Livesey that talks about this. But we're going to use that anyway to get an order of magnitude estimate of the anisotropy constant. You can also get the anisotropy constant from um, temperature-dependent uh, out of uh, out of in-phase susceptibility, in-phase dynamic susceptibility measurements at different frequencies. I'm not going to do those, but I'm just pointing it out. So, so let's look again at that relaxation wall. So, in that paper, they use these very monodispersed particles obtained um, using a method reported by Breland, and again, they showed that there is this deviation from the Langevin model, and they attribute that to significant relaxation. Now, it turns out that we, we co-authored that paper with Breland from Dale, Hu Dale Huber's group, um, where they first reported that synthesis. And in, our, in that paper, we measured for a, for a wide range of particle sizes in the same range that the relaxation wall paper has been carried out, we measured the blocking temperature. And so here is the dependence of blocking temperature on nanoparticle volume from that paper. And so now we can use the equations I showed you in the previous slide to calculate an anisotropy constant. And so we do that here. And so this is the diameter from TEM. Uh, this is the magnetic diameter, which is actually not reported in this paper, but we have it because we did all the measurements. Um, you'll see that the magnetic, the magnetic diameter is much smaller than the physical diameter um, for particles obtained in this paper, which is the same method that was used in this paper. But also importantly, you'll see that the anisotropy constant uh, determined from the blocking temperature, again, a simplification, the anisotropy constant is uh, much larger than the anisotropy constant for magnetite. So the anisotropy constant for bulk magnetite is about 13 kilojoules per cubic meter. And using these blocking temperature measurements and the size of the particles, we get values that are 85, 68, 66. And for the larger particles, we can't even measure the size um, because it would be, um, we can't measure the blocking temp the anisotropy constant because of the large blocking temperature. So it would be larger than 90, light, larger than 120. And so what, what this means is that the relaxation wall is real. I'm not, I'm not arguing against that. But I hope you start to realize now, since I've shown you that the transition from Niel to Brownian depends on the size of the particle and the anisotropy constant, the location of that relaxation wall is going to depend on the anisotropy constant itself. So, so to back this up, I'm going to show you some work that we've done on computational design of, of single core MPI tracers. And so here, uh, we're going to do some, some computational modeling of particle response to the applied field. And we're going to look at those two mechanisms again. Brown relaxation would be physical dipole rotation. Neal relaxation would be internal dipole rotation. Um, for Neal relaxation, you have the uniaxial anisotropy model that I showed you before. But it's important to also realize that magnetite is actually cubic, meaning that it doesn't have a single axis along which the energy is minimum. It actually has um, four axes or eight directions along which the energy is minimum. And that's going to influence uh, the response. And so to, to model here, we're going to solve computationally the landau lifshitz gilbert equation, which is shown here. And this is an equation that describes the dynamics of a magnetic dipole as it processes and damps towards an effect, you know, an, an applied field. And you have terms uh, 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 corresponding to precession and damping. You have uh, a damping constant and a gyromagnetic ratio. 
uh, which are related to properties of the particles, and you have an effective field, and that effective field is going to be the sum of the external field that is applied, for example, the excitation field and MPI, and an isotropy field that um, is driving dipole alignment in the direction of the EC axis or multiple EC axes. You can have, in principle, dipole-dipole interactions, which I'm going to neglect here, but I'm going to bring back later. And finally, you can have thermal energy. Um, you can also model um, the Brownian mechanism using a sto stochastic angular momentum equation. And I'm not going to show a lot of details for that. And there's even papers by others uh, that have shown that you can combine these models, but that's very computationally expensive. So we're not doing that here. So first, some validation. Uh, here are uh, predictions from that from my our computational um, algorithm for the so-called uh, decay or or relaxation of a equilibrium manifestation with time. You can analyze this data and obtain a, re a characteristic relaxation time. And I want to point out that there are models for this. So there's a model from Aharoni in 1973, and there is a model by Brown 1963. I think it's 19 yeah Brown. And there's another one by Eisenstein and Aharoni from 1977. And these models are either in the very small, th uh, very small anisotropy energy or large anisotropy energy regime for uniaxial and cubic particles. And what I'm showing here is that we, what we did in the paper is that we, we uh, selected the value of the damping constant so that we would get good agreement between the computational predictions of the relaxation time and the theoretical predictions from these models. And you can see that. In the in, you know we see that's the case right we have good agreement with the um, with the model by Brown and the model by Eisenstein and Aharoni in in the case where the models apply. Um, we also do exp uh, simulations where we turn on a field and we measure the relaxation time. So this would be representative of relaxation with a field, and that's relevant for MPI because it it can allow us to look at the magnetic field dependence of the relaxation time. And here's the results for cubic anisotropy. This is the relaxation time determined from these simulations as a function of the magnetic field intensity. And what you can see is that as we go from a field intensity of about 10 millitesla to about 200 millitesla, the relaxation time has decreased by an order of magnitude. Uh, the, typical the typical field strength in MPI for the excitation field is in the order of 20 millitesla um, to 45, you know, sorry, 20 millitesla, yeah. And so we're talking some decrease in relaxation time, but not a lot. And that's for cubic anisotropy. And, and again, this is all based on the values that I'm showing below for the anisotropy constant. And it's going to vary depending on the value of the anisotropy constant. Interestingly, we, we find in this, for the uniaxial anisotropy model, we find uh, two regimes, uh, a regime where for certain values of the anisotropy constant and certain values of the applied field, you get a much larger decrease in relaxation time with applied field. And so we think that's interesting. Um, in this work, we also simulate the response to fields representative of MPI, so oscillating fields with bias fields and, and all that stuff. And we develop algorithms to obtain a point spread function. And from that, we can calculate the intensity from the peak and the resolution from the full width at half maximum. And here are some plots um, of the results. And so this is a, a theoretical or computational um, study that shows the effect of the relaxation wall. And so we see here for, for a model that accounts for cubic anisotropy or uniaxial anisotropy, and that accounts for the relaxation time dependence on, on the field, we see that it predicts a relaxation wall as well. So the signal intensity increases with increasing particle size. Eventually, it reaches a peak, and then you get a degradation in performance. And so for this model, for cubic anisotropy, using a certain value of the anisotropy constant, assuming there are no interactions, assuming there's no shape anisotropy, assuming a lot of things, right? For this model, we see a transition. And it's around 35 nanometers. Sorry. Uh, for resolution, we see the same thing. We get improvement in resolution following the Langevin function. And then around 35 nanometers, we start to see deviation. We also see a uh, shifting of the peak location when we hit that relaxation wall. Now, what that also means is that we can do now simulations, right? We can say, what would be the effect of changing the value of the anisotropy constant? And here, don't focus too much on the sizes that are predicted, but focus on the prediction, right? 
And so for a high anisotropy constant particle versus a low anisotropy constant particle, what we see is that for the high anisotropy constant particle, we see a relaxation wall that would happen here at 35. For the low anisotropy constant, in principle, it could happen at 45 to 50 nanometers. Same thing, you would get even better resolution with the low anisotropy constant and very little peak shift. And so as you can imagine, what we're actively doing in my laboratory right now is trying to demonstrate this in practice using particle synthesis. So I'm going to show you what we do in terms of trying to synthesize particles with low anisotropy constant for enhanced MPI performance. Um, and this is work that was primarily carried out by Maitre Uni. Um, she did a lot of the early work on the particle synthesis. And then I, and I'll also show you some more recent work where we now coat those particles and we use them as uh, long circulating half-life contrast agents in MPI. And that was done by Andre Nashu, Sitong Liu, and Anjali Rivera Rodriguez. Okay, so um, uh, there's a lot of ways to synthesize iron oxide. Um, very a lot of methods that are used in the literature. Uh, I would argue that one of the most common methods uh, to obtain um, narrow distribution or close to monodispersed iron oxide nanoparticles is the thermal decomposition method. And in thermal decomposition, what you do is you take an organometallic precursor and you expose it to really high temperature, and it decomposes into the precursor into the metal. And then eventually you hit supersaturation, you nucleate particles, the particles grow, and you get these very nice monodispersed um, coated particles. They're coated with a surfactant. The trick to making monodispersed particles is to separate the nucleation event from growth so that you have a single burst nucleation and then growth of all the particles at the same time. This is an example of a typical um, TEM of those particles. And so you can see they're, they, they're nice, they're photogenic, they're you know, nice and round, and they seem to be monodisperse. Um, if you look at their magnetic response here, I'm showing you the, the magnetization curve, experimental magnetization curve that's been normalized to the saturation magnetization. You see the typical response. You see linear response in low fields, really high slope, saturation. Um, it doesn't seem to have hysteresis or remnants, and so, and so it looks like it's super paramagnetic. But it turns out that you can do more. You can use the Langevin theory and some, some work that's, that was reported in the 1970s by Chantrell, you can obtain the size distribution of the particles. And this is the size distribution of the magnetic dipole. And so normally you would assume that the magnetic dipole or the magnetic domain in single domain particles would be the same as the physical size of the particle. But it turns out um, that for this particle, for example, uh, this is what I alluded to before, you have a size distribution that's very narrow at around 20 nanometers but you actually have a magnetic di diameter distribution that's very broad and much smaller. And um, this, is, um, this is not unique to us. You know, we, this is widely seen in the literature, in the papers that do these analyses. Um, I think the important points to, to, to make here is that um, this, this is widespread. Um, some people attribute it, and as I'll point it out in a minute, to a so-called magnetically dead layer. Um, a lot of people ignore this. They they make the measurements, but the magnetization measurements, but don't they never analyze the data to calculate size distributions. Um, and so I would say that this is one of those um, ugly secrets in the iron oxide literature. Um, why does this happen? So let me go back again to the thermal decomposition synthesis. This is typically done at high temperatures so that the organic vapors are above the flash point. And so that means that we do it in an inert gas. And the reason to do it in an inert gas is because you want to avoid any flashing, any, any explosions. However, for, for us, eventually, um, and this was uh, a lot of it thanks to nice discussions with Maitre, um, we were wondering, I mean, where does the oxygen come from? Because we're trying to make iron oxide, and we're providing an iron precursor. And so in the literature, people will attribute the oxygen. They will say the oxygen, there's a lot of things. Some people will say that you make iron, and then when you expose it to the atmosphere, oxygen from the environment will rapidly oxidize the particles. And I think that that can happen, especially for small particles. Um, another possibility is that the oleic acid has oxygen in the carboxylic acid groups, and that breaks down and provides oxygen. And there's some good evidence of that in the literature. So I, I don't think it's not true. I think it is true. But for me, as a chemical engineer, it doesn't make sense that if my desired product is iron oxide, that I have this really well-controlled synthesis to give me nice monodispersed particles, and yet I'm leaving composition to the whims of 
oxygen leaking into the reactor, oxygen exposure after synthesis, or some secondary degradation reaction of a species that I have no control over. And so to us, it didn't make sense. So what are some potential explanations for this? So like I attributed to before, there's the idea of a non-magnetic dead layer, magnetic surface layer or the magnetically dead layer. And this can be due to surface ligand interaction, spin canting or other things. And the common um, I, I image or idea is that you have a well-magnetized core and a surface that is not well-magnetized. And so you pay that penalty. And so your, your actual particle, that magnetic core or magnetic diameter is gonna be smaller than the physical diameter. Now, uh, this goes back to the 1970s. Uh, and in the early papers, people argued that at most this should be a unit cell, so about a nanometer in thickness. But if you, in the, pap in the few papers that calculate it, and in our own work, it tends to be much larger um, for most particles, especially for particles that are larger than 15 nanometers. It can be as large as six nanometers in thickness. And, and it's often blamed for poor magnetic properties, even without calculating it. You'll see many papers that talk about a magnetically dead layer, and they don't even have a calculation of the thickness or even a reference to, to other papers about it. Um, but this is incontrovertible. There is going to be a magnetically dead layer. The question is whether it's thick enough to explain what we see. And I want to point out that, I, I mean, I showed you only one tidbit of data. In the full paper, we show that this is true for various synthesis, uh, syntheses. Uh, different types of synthesis of iron oxide, and also for commercially available particles. Another possibility is the existence of phase boundaries and defects. And, and this would lead to, even though the particle is small and it's below the single domain size limit, the particle would not be a single domain. And if you have domains in different directions, what that means is that, A, you're going to have the magnetic domains are smaller than the particle size, and also you're going to have interactions between domains that are going to influence the saturation manifestation of the particle, uh, and it's also going to influence their anisotropy constant. And so uh, realizing that we, we were leaving the oxidation of the iron oxide to the whims of secondary reactions or to exposure to the, to the environment or leaking of oxygen, what we decided it was to introduce oxygen as a reagent. And, um, and I, think, I think people haven't, hadn't done this before because of concerns with safety. And so what we do is we introduce molecular or ga gas oxygen. And to do that safely, we use mass flow controllers to titrate the oxygen such that it is slightly above stoichiometric excess. And it turns out that in a typical synthesis, you don't really have a lot of iron in there. So you don't really need a lot of oxygen. And this can be done safely. My lab, we've probably done this synthesis over 200 times. And um, it's really, um, we really haven't had any accidents with it. So we use argon oxygen mixtures. Um, but everything else looks the same, and, and you get particles that are monodispersed. They're not, these are not as pretty as the other ones, I, I, I will accept. You get particles that are super paramagnetic, but most importantly, you get particles that have similar physical and magnetic size distributions. And so the magnetically dead layer here is less than a nanometer. Um, and I think that's exciting because it shows that um, not only that we can do this, I think more importantly, it sheds some light into some of the limitations that may be plaguing a lot of work on thermal decomposition synthesis of magnetic nanoparticles, especially if you're trying to make particles that are larger than, I would argue, about 15 nanometers. In our experience, if we make particles that are about 10 nanometers, we typically get good agreement between the physical and magnetic size distributions. If we do high resolution electron microscopy, this is what the particles look like. This is particles synthesized without oxygen. And so here you can actually see what I alluded to before. You have a particle that is below the single domain size limit and it has many different crystal directions and domains. These are the particles synthesized in oxygen. And so in this case, the entire particle is in the same direction. And, um, and I don't show it here, but in the paper, we also demonstrate that um, in the case of particles synthesized with oxygen, the crystallite size obtained from Scherer's equation and XRD agrees with the physical size and the magnetic size. And so that, that to us makes a lot of sense. Importantly, this leads to improvement in, in surface saturation manifestation, for example. These are two particles with the same physical diameter, one obtained uh, synthesized without oxygen and one with oxygen. And what we see is that the saturation manifestation of the particles with oxygen is much less. And here we've done um, elemental analysis to obtain the iron content to then normalize the data. I think more importantly for MPI is are these results. And so this is now going to be um, 
dynamic susceptibility and phase susceptibility as a function of temperature at different frequencies, which, as I alluded to before, can be used to estimate the value of the anisotropy constant. And so these are particles um, that are synthesized in the absence of oxygen. And these are particles that are synthesized in the, in the presence of oxygen. The physical size of the two particles is the same. The magnetic diameter of these particles is 12, and the magnetic diameter of these particles is 17. If we now use this model, this analysis, to calculate an anisotropy constant, what we see is that without oxygen, if we use the Niel model, we get an anisotropy constant of about 100 kilojoules per cubic meter. And if we account for interactions using the so-called vogel fulcher model, we get an anisotropy constant of about 70 kilojoules per cubic meter. But if we synthesize them with oxygen, we actually get a value that is in the order of magnitude um, of bulk magnetite. So it's 17 with the Niel model, 5.9 with the vogel fulcher And I'm not claiming that it's 5.9. I think the important thing here is that it's in the same order of magnitude as bulk magnetite, which is about 13 kilojoules per cubic meter. And so we think that because we're synthesizing these particles uh, as a whole magnetic domains with very few defects, and that's visible from the uh, stem HADF uh, imaging, um, we think that we're eliminating uh, the, the presence of defects and other interactions, internal particle interactions, that uh, artificially increase the anisotropy constant. This also translates to improved performance in applications. And so here I'm showing two applications that are relevant in terms of the, um, their response to applied alternating fields. One is uh, the, the particle synthesized with oxygen, same physical diameter again, same physical diameter. The only difference is one is with, without oxygen, one with oxygen. The particle synthesized with oxygen have a much higher SAR value, a much higher rate of energy dissipation um, for hyperthermia applications. Uh, similarly, the particles synthesized with oxygen have a higher, higher uh, sensitivity and slightly better resolution in MPI uh, as obtained from the point spread function. And that's what we're doing now. And so this is an example here of work we're doing. Um, RL2 is our second generation tracer. We just published something on our first generation tracer. Um, there's um, ferrocarbotran is a commonly used commercial tracer shown here in red. Black is another commercial tracer, which is a quite a good one. Uh, Sinomag is actually quite a good tracer in our opinion. Uh, and then this is our tracer, which is slightly better than Sinomag. Um, and we like it because we know what's in the surface so we can do uh, a lot of surface modification to it. And uh, our preferred method for surface coating for applications that are going to require long circulation times is to uh, do ligand exchanges with uh, peg silane layers so that we can get a commonly bonded um, brush of peg. And we can control the hydrodynamic size of the particles using the molecular weight of the peg uh, that's being coated. And we've published on this extensively demonstrating that they're stable in a wide range of um, biological media, culture solutions, even in, in whole blood. And this is now uh, results from, from our work um, with these particles, which were recently published in Nanotheranostics. Uh, here you have um, time series images for MPI. There's a mouse, um, and we've injected particles systemically via tail vein. And these are images taken at various time points of the same mouse. And what you see is initially the signal is in the heart, and eventually it goes to the liver and spleen. Uh, these mice don't have tumors because we did this right after the pandemic, right after we were allowed to go back to lab. And at that time, we, we weren't allowed to do tumor work. And so we just did naive mice. Here are some really nice uh, 3D scans of, this, of the time points at one hour and 24 hours. Here you can clearly see the heart and, and major arteries. And here you can see the, the, the liver and the spleen, and you can make out the lobes of the spleen, which I think is really exciting. But more importantly, we can quantify. And so here is ferrocarbotran, which is commonly used. We can quantify the signal in the liver. We can quantify the signal in the heart region. And um, we're using only three mice um, and measuring, uh, analyzing the mice at different time points. You can obtain data that can then be used in compartment models to calculate a circulation half-life. And so here, we see a circulation half-life of about, about 0.6 hours for for the ferrocarbotran. But I want to point out that we didn't take measurements fast enough in the initial time points uh, to be able to catch an initial drop. And we know from the literature that ferrocarbotran should have bi-exponential decay. And so we didn't catch the first exponential. Uh, these are our particles uh, coated with PEG. And so here we can see that these particles circulate. We still, we, the half-life in the heart is about seven hours. And the accumulation half-life for the liver is about seven hours as well. 
So this is a very long circulating tracer that also has been you know, optimized, if you will, for MPI. OK, so I, I think I'm going to stop there because it's 10.50. And I want to see if there's any questions that have been accumulating. Uh, Andres? Hi, Carlos. Thanks for the very nice presentation. Uh, sorry. sorry. There, are, there are some questions here. I don't know why. Are you hearing me well? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear yeah. you. OK, we have some, some questions here already, Carlos, from Dr. Honi Mioto from Feather University of ABC. The question is the following. It is clear that the Nisotropy has an important role in the MPI signal. How do you think aggregation impacts the mechanism and the quality of the signal? So, so I'm not going to be able to talk about it today, but, but that's the next topic, and I'll talk about it tomorrow. Um, we, we know that interactions can, can lead to improved performance under certain conditions, but I also want to point out that interactions because of aggregates can also lead to degradation of performance. And I think that here we can draw a parallel to the hyperthermia literature. I'm sure many of the people in the audience are familiar with the hyperthermia literature. Under some conditions, aggregation and chain formation can lead to improvements in, in, in hyperthermia and, and heating rates. But under certain conditions, it can also lead to worsening. And so I think the devil here is going to be in the details. Um, I'll tell you this. Uh, Cinomag is a really good tracer. It turns out that Cinomag, or, or at least in our, in our experience, has been a very good tracer. Uh, Cinomag is a, is a clustered particle, right? So it's smaller particles in, 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 cl in clusters. And yet it behaves like a larger particle. And so I think there uh, it's working to its advantage. There are other questions here. They are appearing now. Uh, Isabella Ferreira, uh, she doesn't say from where she is. She thanks for the lecture. And the question is, I would like to know from which size the nanoparticles begin to have measurable depositions in tissues that could prejudice further exams or even harm the tissue. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. So a, a, a common question will be, what is the fate of the particles, right? What happens later? And, and this is um, it's going to depend on size. It's going to depend on surface coating. It's going to depend the, on the disease state, OK? But what most commonly happens is what's shown in the, in the slide that I'm sharing, right? Particles will circulate and eventually will accumulate in the liver and the spleen. And what typically happens is that they're taken up by macrophages in these organs, right? These organs are. One of their functions is to filter blood um, from foreign objects. And so depending on the coating, um, you can have those particles break down in the liver. Um, in, the, in the day, in the 80s, um, there were several papers that looked at biotransformation of magnetite after it accumulates in the liver. And it's believed that it's broken down in the macrophages and the lysosomes, and the iron becomes part of the, uh, the hemoglobin and the ferritin in the body. And that was for the case of particles coated with dextran. Um, particles coated with a, with a polymeric substance may take longer to degrade. Now, one of the nice things about MPI is that as long as the particles are there and they're still nanoparticles, we can image them. And this, there is a nice paper that looks at long-term imaging of MPI where particles accumulate in the liver. And if I remember correctly in that paper, for the particles they looked at, within four weeks, four weeks the signal in the liver has dropped significantly. And so that, and so that suggests either breakdown of the particles, excretion uh, of the particles, or, or another possibility always the particles, particles that are distributed by the body and there will be lower concentration. So we, so we think that, that you know, we, should, we, should, we should be able to do it. Yeah, yeah. So also, if you're imaging, imaging away from the liver, liver, the fact that you have part, part of the liver, liver, liver will not be a problem. problem. And in terms, and in terms of, of harm, harm, and again, it's very, it's very part of the part of part of you make, that's the test of toxicity. But the Arnold say so, we don't think we can cause and cause these toxicities. I don't know. There might be some some other thing opening there, because there is a little bit of interference between oh, my side, my side. Be at your side, I'm not sure. Are you hearing me well? I can hear you, you fine. Yeah. It's just me. There's another question here, Carlos. Uh, following Isabella, I'm also interested to know how the particles get out of the mouse body after the measurements. I mean, about the natural clearance process of mouse. 
Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I alluded to that in that previous, previous question. question. So, so in, 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 in mass work, work there's, there's been evidence, evidence that, that the particles can be broken down in isocytes, for example, example in macrophages. macrophages. Um, and then the iron becomes available and it becomes part of the hemoglobin and ferritin. That was done for, 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 for um, dextrin for the particles. So Carlos, 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 sorry, Carlos. I think that there is some problem with the with the with the sound. Could you turn off your your loudspeaker and try it again? I, I don't know. It's like uh, people are not hearing very well the answer. Now it's okay. So. You don't have two things open there in your lab, do you? The loudspeaker. No, right? It's like an interference. Let me check what I'm using right now. We are seeing, we are hearing a noise here. I don't know if everybody's hearing. The organizers. Try to what uh, to reconnect him, Carlos. You're hearing me right now. Can right? you still hear me? Is, is, is yeah. Now, now it's great. Now it's great, Carlos. Okay. Now it's great. Okay. Okay. Sorry if that was going on for a while. Um, so yeah, do you want me to answer any of the questions again? Yes, Carlos. Uh, at least the, the last one regarding. I think the last one was what happens in terms of uh, clearance. And yes, exactly. I alluded to, yeah, I alluded exactly. to that in my answer to the previous question. But basically, again, from the work done with dextran coated particles for MRI, uh, there it was shown that the iron oxide eventually breaks down in the liver, in the you know probably lysosomal degradation in the in macrophages, and the iron becomes incorporated into the hemoglobin and ferritin. But that was for dextran coated. So every time we make a new particle and we put a different coating, that can influence the mechanism of degradation and the time scale of degradation. And so I also alluded to the fact that with MPI, as long as the particles are there, we should see a signal. And uh, there is one paper um, where they look at long-term clearance or long-term imaging, and they see that the signal uh, starts to disappear from the liver in a matter of weeks. I think it was four weeks, the time scale. So, so that doesn't answer the mechanism. It, it, it just um, answers the fact that it is, they're believed to be breaking down and they, they can also be excreted. Um, but again, the, the, the details of how is going to depend on the particle itself. So I don't want to extrapolate. And basically, you are using particles that probably would be clear to be hepatic, right? Hepatic, because of the size. So if yeah, the size is very small, it could be renal. But there is no renal clearance in this case because the size that you're using, it's very large. That's right. That's right. So the particles are too large to go through the urine, right? Um, and and it has to be this way because for MPI, to clear through the through the renal system, you would have to be below five nanometers, and those particles are gonna be very poor MPI tracers. You think that there is a way for improving this for MPI? Is there a possibility of trying to build these very small nanoparticles that could be uh, used for renal clearance for MPI, do you think that in the future someone could could go for a, a for try some strategy? What do you think about that? I think you know it's always difficult to predict these things, right? I think based on what we know now about the physics of MPI, I think a particle that's five nanometers will have a hard time generating a significant signal because the signal is going to scale as the cube of the diameter, um, and it's and it's going to scale as a domain maxation. So as you go from a 25 nanometer particle to a five nanometer particle, if you cube it, you're decreasing the signal by a factor of 125. And you don't have domain manifestations that, that will increase that much. However, I will point out that in the case of interactions, um, you could get better performance from interacting small particles. So for example, in ferrocarbitron, there are some really nice papers that argue that the reason ferrocarbitron has decent properties, even though it's made up of six nanometer particles or for the most part, is because the particles are in this dextran coating and they interact with each other and that leads to improved performance. However, for that to work, the particles have to be in close proximity. In, in ferrocarbitron, they're encapsulated in, de in a dextran shell. 
So the hydrodynamic diameter is about 60, even though the individual particles are about five to six. So that is a small core, but it's not going to get through the renal system because the hydrodynamic diameter is what's going to determine whether you can get out through the renal pathway. Thanks. Isabella was from the Federal University of Alagoas. So it's the Northeast, it's an example of Northeast. I'm not seeing any more questions here right now. So we are almost, ah, there is another one. Dr. Sarendra Sharma from India. Uh, the question is, can you please comment a little bit on how the shape and isotropy of the nanoparticles affect MPI signal? There's li very little work on that. Um, and um, so what I expect is, as you get shape anisotropy, shape anisotropy will only increase your effective anisotropy, right? And so the total anisotropy of a particle is going to be the sum of magnetocrystalline anisotropy, shape anisotropy, et cetera. And so shape anisotropy is going to increase your effect, your net anisotropy. And that means that it's going to push that relaxation wall to lower values. However, um, that also means that particles with shape anisotropy are going to have some more complex mixture of Niel and Brownian response. And so I think, and I'm going to just guess here, um, that uh, shape anisotropy might be a useful tool in color MPI. And so in color MPI, you want particles that, that will respond to different excitation fields and frequencies slightly differently so you can, you can tease out which particles you're getting a signal from. Uh, I think, um, and this is my gut feeling, this, I'm not, I, if you ask me why, I'm going to say, well, because because all my years of working with, with these particles tells me <laughs> that they might be interesting. Uh, but I would say that shape anisotropy is gonna is probably gonna be interesting in color MPI. Okay. Let me see if there is another question here right now. I'm not seeing any other question here. Um, maybe you can mention a little bit. What do you think? You, it was there was a question here regarding uh, aggregation, particle-particle interaction. And yeah. you told that the magnetite has a cubic anisotropy. What do you think would be the anisotropy contribution from particle-particle interaction? Do you think that it could be a uniex contribution or something different? Can you mention that's gonna, a little bit? Yeah, that's going to depend on the arrangement of the particles, right? And so, for example, in, in the work, I'll, and Tomorrow I was going to talk mostly about applications, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this other work. Um, in, in this work that I was going to talk about next, uh, the particles form chains. And, and so that gives you an apparent uniaxial anisotropy. Uh, or I, I wouldn't, it's not magnetocrystalline, right? But it gives you a uniaxial character to an anisotropy because of interactions. But if you had clusters of particles and they're randomly oriented, then it's going to be a much more complicated situation. So, so yeah, I think aggregation, I think interactions, if we can control interactions such that we have particles that, and this is what we, we show in, in this work, and, and there's a paper and under review, and we also publish a theoretical paper. If you can, if you can use interactions to force a particle to basically switch from a saturated state to another saturated state, that's the perfect MPI particle. Uh, the perfect MPI particle would be a square wave. Um, but um, that's hard to obtain. And so one way might be with interactions. Carlos, I think that we are, people are starting to get hangry here. Yeah. <laughs> <In Brazil. laughs> uh, I would thank a lot for your two lectures here. And we are very anxious to hear you tomorrow at yes. 9 a.m. Brazilian time and a little bit earlier there. Uh, 8 a.m. Yes. At 8 a.m. Thanks a lot for your very, very nice presentation. And I hope that everybody was here to, to thank you. But I'm sure that in the in the web, uh, we are very thank you for, for this excellent presentation. Carlos, thank you, very Ari. Nice I'll, to, see you. I'll see you to tomorrow have. and I'll be... I'll be around for the other sessions for the other speakers. Okay, see you around. Bye bye, okay. Carlos. Have a nice bye. time. Bye. Thank you all for being here. And don't forget that at 2 p.m. Brazil time, we have Dr. Robert Ivkov. And then at 4 p.m., we have Dr. Rohan Fernandez. See you later. Bye bye, guys.